uh, you know, little by little, you'll learn that doctrine, and then it can work in you to overcome the carnality. Uh, so then the result then is if it's the doctrine doing it, and it's not Paul or Paulus or Cephas or Christ, it's rather the doctrine working in you, then you can't glory in Paul or Apollos. You can't glory in men. But rather, as verse 21 says, uh, you know, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. You've been given, you've got God's completed word here. Uh, Ephesians 1 talks about, in verse 8, says that God hath abounded toward us uh, toward all, in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, Colossians 1.25 says that the mystery fulfills the word of God. So you have all of God's wisdom for today right here in the Bible. All things are yours, as he says there in chapter 3, verse 21. It's just you now have, need to take advantage of that opportunity that you have to partake in those things, the deep things of God. If you're going to learn those, we're told the Holy Spirit has to teach them to you using the mind of Christ. And so it's just getting in the Word, learning that doctrine. And uh, it's not anything man does so that you don't glory in men. So you don't glory in men over your salvation, and you don't glory in men in your sanctification because it's all by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, both to save you through His shed blood on the cross and to sanctify you through the Word, which is made possible by His death on the cross. Again, the power that He had over God's enemies in order to bring you this mystery uh, doctrine that He has in these epistles. So chapter 3, uh, if you want to overcome the carnality that the Corinthians experienced, then you need to learn the mystery doctrine in order to label, labor for God. Then in chapter 4, uh, I've got their knowledge. And uh, if as you go through the outline, you can see a lot of it is either knowledge, and he's sort of building on that. Um, and then after that, then he adds charity into it. Um, knowledge and charity combined uh, will cause you to overcome the lust of the flesh, excuse me. So in chapter 4 there, uh, he starts talking about knowledge. Now that we understand that it's the mystery doctrine that does it, uh, now he goes one step further, and uh, you're filling the blank there in chapter 4, is that uh, learning mystery doctrine means following Paul's example of suffering for Christ. Learning mystery doctrine means following Paul's example of suffering for Christ. And he, he's going to give that to you in chapter 4 there. The point is, is that as you learn the doctrine, the doctrine gets a hold of you, it strengthens the inner man. Well, now, you're not glorying in men, but you're, you're still, in other words, you're not in heaven yet. You're still on earth, and you're still, in, still dealing with men, both in the church and outside of the church, who, for the most part, are not uh, following God and His Word for today. So, when you're in that different structure there, then you've got to then you've got suffering involved. You know, Ephesians chapter 6 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So there's a battle, a spiritual warfare, a battle of spiritual warfare that goes on as a result of you learning the mystery doctrine. And you're compassed about with all these people who are, e even if they're saved, a lot of them, if they don't have faith in the doctrine, end up not knowing so, but they end up fighting on the wrong side. They're standing for... Uh, false doctrine and false truths. And so when you stand up for the doctrine that God teaches through your, His Word, then you're on the other side of the battle, and so then there's suffering involved. You know, if you're, if you're uh, you know, if we're, say, the United States are in a war, and you go out on the battlefield, uh, there's going to be some suffering involved there. E even if you're not hit, even if you're not injured, uh, still just suffering the conditions, the warlike conditions, um, there's suffering involved. Same thing for us today. If we believe the word rightly divided and we allow that sound doctrine to take hold, um, you're in a world surrounded by the enemy, basically, that's for the most part isn't believing that doctrine and isn't following it. So the result is suffering. And so he warns you of that, uh, that you will end up suffering for Christ. Uh, you see his example. Let's see, if we go down to verse 15... You can see the situation that's a lot like what we have in Christianity today as far as you know, what people say. It says there in chapter 4, verse 15, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So there are 
potentially 10,000 people out there who would instruct you in Christ, but yet their instruction isn't God's word rightly divided. It's not in the sound doctrine. And so Paul is saying, now stop following them, but rather follow uh, the sound doctrine. And that's why he says in verse 16, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He's not telling them to follow, follow Paul in the flesh or worship him. Rather, it's Paul has learned the doctrine. The Lord Jesus Christ gave it to him by direct revelation. And he's learned it and he's allowed that doctrine to take a hold in him and um, work and allow the Holy Spirit to work through him. And, and so that's what he's done. And he's basically saying that's what you need to do too. Uh, you know, he said in chapter 3 that all things are yours. So you've got that doctrine. Now you need to uh, read it, believe it, allow the Holy Spirit to work it through you. And that's how you end up following Paul. Rather than following those 10,000 instructors, uh, follow the doctrine and allow it to work through you. And he gives the example in uh, verses 9 through 14, the example of suffering. Because uh, here he is following the doctrine and there's, you know, like today, you'll see what's popular in Christianity is the health and wealth gospel, thinking that you'll have your, your best life now or you, you'll be happy in this life. You know, you should seek out the things of this life. Uh, you'll be rewarded by God in, the, in this life. But yet, it's just the opposite. If you're in that battle and the people out there are on the other side, you're not going to be getting material wealth and happiness and, you know, as far as getting all these blessings in the material world, those come spiritually. And so he says there in, in verse 9, he says, For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men. You know, they think we're just a show. You know, they're making fun of us. You know, what are these crazy Christians doing here? You know, suffering for Christ, being willing to be tortured and beaten and killed just just for some guy who died on a cross? You know, that's, that's crazy. Uh, he says in verse 10, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. So there's a problem with the Corinthians here. Because they are carnal, following the lust of the flesh, they're going right along with the course of this world. They're going right along with Satan's game plan. And the result is, they are supposedly wise in Christ because of the wisdom they have. They are, they are supposedly strong. They are supposedly honorable. Uh, but um, those who are really allowing the doctrine to work through them, it's just the opposite. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake. We are weak and we are despised. So it's the opposite of what's happening to the Corinthians. It shows the Corinthians aren't following the doctrine because they're not suffering in this present world. Um, suffering doesn't mean that you're going to be, in, like in this case, like Paul did. You know, He was shipwrecked, he was beaten with rods, he was stoned. Not necessarily that, but it just could be a suffering of a, you know, a mental type thing. People not wanting to associate with you because you've got these crazy views. or you know, it's, It can take that kind of form. He says in verse 11, uh, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands being reviled we bless being persecuted we suffer it being defamed we entreat we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day I write not these things to shame you but as my beloved sons I warn you so here are the Corinthians they are considered wise in Christ they are considered strong they are considered honorable and Paul is warning them and saying, if the world thinks you are wise in Christ and you are strong and you are honorable and the world is following Satan and his doctrine, then something's wrong. You're following the wrong doctrine. You need to follow uh, the mystery doctrine for today. Then you'll be just like us, Paul says. Then you'll be fools for Christ's sake. Then you'll be weak. Then you'll be despised. You'll be the filth and offscurring of the world. That's what you want to be. Uh, you know, it sounds... It sounds like contradictory thinking, but when you're in a world where the enemy is in control for the time being, you know, Satan is the god of this world, he's got the world enrolled in this course, his policy of evil, he, the world is following the lie program, and then here you are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum with faith in Christ, believing the truth of his word, allowing the doctrine to work through you, well, those are two opposing sides, they don't get along, so you should expect 
the world to think you're you're crazy, that you're a lunatic and that you don't know what you're talking about. And the fact that in the Corinthians case that they are just considered wise people and people like them, well then, you know, you got to wonder, that's that's not a good position to be in, spiritually speaking. So, um, so chapter 4 is when you learn that mystery doctrine, it means that you're going to suffer for Christ. Uh, chapter 5 now, so... So now you've got the, the basis of putting away man's doctrine and learning the mystery doctrine, allowing that to work through you, understanding that that's contrary to what the world says, so that you'll end up suffering as a result. And now, in the next uh, three chapters here, uh, Paul is going to go through some examples of what's going on in the church, and it's you can see the progression that as the knowledge of the mystery doctrine and uh, of... Uh, Paul's epistles comes in and it strengthens the inner man, then your attitude or what you do with sin is uh, you progressively get farther away from it. I've written in bold there, if you look on your outline, chapter 5, that just, the bold, just look at the bold statements. In chapter 5, it says knowledge results in doing away with sin. So that's the first thing. Once your inner man is strengthened with the doctrine, then you end up naturally, the doctrine working through you, you do away with the sin that's in your life. Then in chapter 6, it says knowledge results in not pursuing sin. So first you do away with the sin. Then chapter 6, you end up not pursuing the sin. And then in chapter 7, knowledge results in preventative measures to avoid sin. So you can see the progression there. First, you know, you've got this sinful lifestyle, carnality, just like the Corinthians were. Uh, they were saved, but they weren't allowing the doctrine to work through them. Once they allow that doctrine to work through them, then they start putting away with that sin that they had in their lives. So now the sin's put away. The next step is they don't even pursue the sin anymore. And then the step after that is now you're going to take preventive measures. Since you're not pursuing the sin, you're not pursuing the things of the flesh, then you're going to take the preventative measures to avoid sin. So that's the next three chapters here. Uh, he deals with issues uh, that are going on in the church, but at the same time in dealing with those issues, he shows the progression of what that doctrine will do for you. Uh, it's not you saying, I'm going to do it myself, I'm going to stop doing this sin. It's the understanding of the doctrine working in the inner man to strengthen it, and it will cause that process. Uh, just like Romans 1, you see the downward spiral into sin, where first men uh, believe that uh, the opposite sex is God, then the second step they believe the same sex is God, and then the third step they believe that, uh, that they can just do whatever they want, that they themselves are God, uh, and they go farther and farther down into evil. Uh, that's in Romans 1. Well, here in 1 Corinthians you see that the step out of that sin is a three-step process as well. Doing away with the sin, then not pursuing the sin, and then having the preventative measures to avoid the sin. So in chapter 5, uh, the issue, uh, verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious what's going on here. And not only that, verse 2 tells you, it says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Uh, so you've got this immorality, sexual immorality that's going on in the church, and the reaction of the church as a whole isn't to do away with it. They're not ashamed of it, but rather they're bragging about it. They're bragging about that they can do this and still be, still have eternal life. You can have all these blessings in heavenly places and still get away with this. Um, but, you know, Paul has been trying to get you into mystery doctrine by this point, and so his conclusion isn't, you know, not to continue to end this, but doing away with it. He says in verse 5 that their attitude toward the person who is sinning, it says, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't lose the salvation. His spirit is still saved. But rather, that he's saying, kick this guy out. And your, your point on your outline is that those living sinful lifestyles should not be part of the church. Uh, those living sinful lifestyles should not be part of the church. You may say, well, they're still saved. They have eternal life. They're going to be with us in heaven. Uh, why wouldn't we 
keep them in the church. And after all, isn't that, didn't, and this is the big thing today, people will say, you know, who are you to judge them? Why wouldn't you show God's love to them? You're, you're hating them if you kick them out. You should be welcoming them and embracing them and showing, uh, or else you're not showing love to them. That's what they say. But the point is, if the doctrine is what changes you, and you've got this lifestyle in here, and now people aren't following the doctrine anymore, but they're bragging about this sinful lifestyle, well then the whole church as a whole is not going to be edified in the doctrine. They're going to be involved in sin, and now you know they're not allowing God to work through them anymore. Uh, that's what he says in verse 6. He says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Um, the leaven there is a type of sin in your Bible, and so it's basically saying that uh, the little, you know, the illustration is if you've got uh, some dough and you're trying to make some bread, you know, you just put a little leaven in there, it's going to uh, leaven the whole lump. It's not just going to, you're not going to have a loaf of bread that comes out with just one side that's completely up here right, that rows and then the other side is just all flat. Um, if you've got just a little leaven in there and you've mixed it all in, well then that whole loaf is going to be leavened. Uh, that's the illustration there and so what he's saying is that if you allow sinful lifestyles in the church to continue, well then it will end up causing sinful lifestyles to just continue in as a church as a whole. It won't just be one person who's doing it it'll be the church as a whole involved in it. Um, now that's not to say that yeah, if, if it was just, in other words, if, if it was just a sin that someone did and you say, oh I heard, I heard that you lied to this guy over here yesterday so you're out of the church. Oh I heard that you, uh, you had a, a bad thought so you're out of the church. I mean if you did that there wouldn't be anybody left because all of us, no matter how far along we are in the sanctification process, all of us serve the lust of the flesh. Um, all of us sin, probably every day, you know, at some point or another. Uh, so if you're kicking out everybody if they commit a sin, well then no one's left, you know, including me. Everybody's out the door. So that's not what he's talking about. Oh, I heard you sinned, you're out. It's rather, it's this sinful lifestyle. It's something that you, it's a continuance in this and the attitude toward it as well. It's not something that he's... Uh, wanting to allow God to work through him to get out of that sin. He's not wanting to read the Word, understand the doctrine so that it can work through him and he wouldn't be doing the sin anymore. It's He's saying, you know, look at what I can get away with. And he's he's got that attitude. When someone uh, has a continual sinful lifestyle, continual sin, and they're not willing to deal with it, uh, they're just thinking, well, I can continue in this, then that's the point when someone is to be kicked out of the church when because then if you don't then it's then the sinful lifestyle leavens the whole lump and then you end up having a church full of people who are doing nothing but just in their carnality in the flesh that's what was happening at the Corinthian church he said in chapter 3 ye are yet carnal he says basically you're doing what everybody else is doing outside the church you're doing the same things here and the result is just it's just that little leaven that came in so he's telling them basically kick them out. Uh, in this case, we will learn over in 2 Corinthians that really kicking them out meant not having the fellowship anymore with the body of Christ. And that person, as we find in 2 Corinthians, that person actually, uh, after being kicked out, understood uh, what was going on and allowed the doctrine to work through him such that he did not do that sin anymore. And then he comes back and he says, okay, I'm not in this... Uh, ancestral relationship anymore let me into the church and they says oh no no you can't come in here so then they're being too hard on them you get the reverse in 2nd Corinthians where Paul says you gotta let this guy back in yeah don't don't have this root of bitterness against him uh, he's allowed the doctrine to work through him um, he's not in that sinful lifestyle anymore you should welcome him with open arms uh, so the point isn't you know we're not gonna have anything to do with you the point is getting the sinful lifestyle out of the church so that it doesn't continue uh, to cause others to get into that sinful lifestyle. And then the result then is that tough love that you've shown to them 
then they can allow the doctrine to work through them, recognizing the fellowship with fellow believers has been severed so that they can then come back after they've allowed that sin to be worked out of them through the mystery doctrine. Uh, so uh, that's chapter 5, and um, the key verses there, verse 11, I, I mentioned verse 6 about the little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Uh, also in verse 11, he says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one no, not to eat. Um, again, that's a lifestyle. I mean, all of us sin, all of us commit, you know, in, at least in the mind probably commit, you know, sins in all these categories. But uh, that doesn't mean kick everybody out. It's just that sinful lifestyle that continues. He says, you know, don't even fellowship with that person. Um, so that's, that's how, when you have that mystery doctrine, then that's going to result in you using that, uh, instead of using your feelings to to figure out what you're going to do. You allow the doctrine to work through you and you use that sound doctrine to make the decision that we need to do away with sin. Sinful lifestyle should not be part of the church. And so that's what you get in chapter 5. Um, we're out of time today so we'll continue next week but uh, then there's the progression of not even pursuing sin and then not um, and then trying to avoid sin. So it's really, the point is to the Corinthians it's not anything where you set your mind and say, I'm going to not do this sin. I'm going to do these good things. The way, the way that you live for Christ is just reading Paul's epistles, allowing that doctrine to strengthen the inner man, and then the natural result will be doing away with sin, not pursuing sin, and then having those preventive measures to avoid sin. So we'll pick up in chapter 6 next time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I just thank you for the doctrine that you've given us that allows us to serve you through yielding to you, having faith in your word. And I pray that as we continue to read through Paul's epistles and study through them, that we won't try to follow man or man's philosophies or religion, but we'll just believe what your word says, rightly divided, so that you can work out issues in our lives, not that any of us are perfect or not that we ever will be in this life, but that we will um, continue to allow the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ to sanctify us through the washing of the water of the Word um, so that we may be servants of God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thanks again. And remember, if you have any questions, you can put them in the offering box today or you can do it next week. And be sure to fill out the names and addresses so we can have that and Paul and I can make up a church directory. And I promise I will not sell your information to a third party. <laughs>